Virtual hot springs are confined to areas where molten, or at least recently molten, rocks occur close to the Earth's surface. And after four and a half thousand million years, it's clear that the Earth's interior is still hot, and that's because energy is being continuously produced by radioactive decay of long-lived isotopes of uranium, thorium, and potassium. Now, in the case of uranium, we can utilize the energy much more efficiently and rapidly by inducing those atoms to undergo fission in a nuclear reactor. And that's a much more efficient process than harnessing the energy of hot springs, such as these in Colorado. But for the nuclear industry to function effectively, we need to understand how uranium is concentrated in the Earth's crust in order to choose the best places to mine. Some igneous rocks, like granite for example, provide the link between average crust and an economic uranium deposit. Now this granite's in the Rocky Mountains of Colorado. And I'm going to use this gamma ray spectrometer to record the natural radiation that's coming out of the rock. At the moment it's reading background, but if I point it towards the outcrop, the numbers and the note that's produced by the buzzer correspond to the amount of uranium that's present. And that number represents about 50 parts per million of uranium in this granite. That's a considerable advance on average crust, which was four parts per million. Now, uraniferous granites, like this one, probably represent the culmination of several phases of uranium concentration in the crust by remelting processes. Let's take a closer look at the rock. The minerals that are present are grey, glassy quartz, pink felspar, and black flakes of biotite mica. A magnified thin section shows tiny crystals of uranium-bearing minerals contained within grains of brown biotite mica. Well, there are several geological processes that can take the uranium that's present in a granite like this one and concentrate it and so produce an economical deposit. And in this program, we're going to visit three working uranium mines in different geological settings. But first, we'll consider those concentrating processes. Imagine a piece of folded, metamorphosed, continental basement, which is intruded by uraniferous granite. Economic deposits may be found in the coarse-grained pegmatites resulting from late-stage fluids that concentrate uranium. They're also deposited in the stockwork of small veins which form in fissures produced when the granite was emplaced. Uranium deposits that are clearly associated with igneous activity are called primary. When a uraniferous granite or even a primary ore deposit is eroded, the sedimentary rocks forming in an adjacent depositional basin may contain secondary uranium ore bodies. Primary uraninite grains are broken down to produce soluble uranium-6 plus ions by oxidizing groundwaters passing through the sediments derived from a uranium-rich granite. Soluble uranium is carried along until conditions become sufficiently reducing that black uranium minerals are re-precipitated. Another way in which ore deposits can form within uraniferous sediments is when during a later phase of subsidence, orogenic activity and igneous intrusion, hydrothermal fluid convection cells develop over the heat source. Uranium may be leached from a relatively large crustal volume as fluids are drawn down towards the heat source. It's re-precipitated in concentrated form in the zone of cooling and upwelling. Fault zones are prone to this kind of mineralization, giving rise to vein-type ore bodies. Fault zones beneath unconformities with overlying impermeable sediments are particularly ideal. Most minerals are found first in vein-type deposits, and most of the richest uranium ores occur in veins, often at depth. I'm 200 meters below the surface in the Schwarzwalder uranium mine near Denver in Colorado. And the rocks around here are all like this. It's a dark gray, fine-grained Precambrian mica schist. Now the schists are cut by a complex series of mineralized veins. Here's one example, here's the top, and here's the bottom of a mineral vein. And these are all very rich in uranium, so rich that they were too much for our sensitive spectrometer, so I've borrowed this one, which reads in percent, and it's recording just there between 5 and 6% of U308. 
the local geologists who have looked at the whole vein reckon that it contains an average of 4.4%. Now, the trend of this mineral vein up this incline at about 30 degrees means that the technique of mining has to be adapted to take into account the nature of the deposit. And this technique is called slope mining. Once a promising zone of ore has been located using the spectrometer, it's peppered with drill holes that will be used to fire shots, so bringing down blocks of ore and advancing the opening or stope. The broken ore is moved down the stope using a bucket-like device known as a slusher. At the bottom, the blocks fall through a coarse screen into trucks which are hoisted to the surface. But the Schwarzwalder mine doesn't consist entirely of stopes. This 600 meter deep mine has 19 levels which are worked across a mineralized fault zone. The stopes are confined to mineralized fractures that were produced during faulting and which occur in the upper or hanging wall of the main fault. The reason why there are so many levels is because the main fault zone is nearly vertical. But it's not just a simple fault zone. It's a series of complex fractures that extend out over quite a large region. Now, here we've got examples of angular fragments of mica schist set in a matrix of calcite. These angular fragments uh, were probably produced during the faulting motion. Pieces of wall rock would have been ripped off as shearing took place. Now, we call this a breccia. It's a fault breccia. The calcite that we see in the matrix and also in these crystal line cavities was deposited from hot mineralizing solutions that forced their way up through the fault zone, which was permeable because it was brecciated. But not only do we find calcite, other minerals were deposited, such as this sulfide up here, and more importantly, oxide minerals, such as the uraninite. Now, the whole of the mineralization in the fault zone occurred during the uplift of the Rocky Mountain region about 70 to 100 million years ago. Carboniferous and Permian sediments containing dispersed uranium were thrust over the Precambrian rocks from the east. A magmatic heat source from below initiated a hydrothermal convection cycle fed by meteoric water, which concentrated uranium in zones of fluid upflow within faulted regions. And here in the stope, the zone of economic mineralization is just a few tens of centimeters thick. This reddish material is the ore. It's red because it contains the iron oxide mineral hematite. Now then, with several percent of uranium, this is a rich ore vein. But of course, it would be impossible to mine it in isolation. And to provide a reasonable working height, material from above the ore and sometimes from below the ore must be transported to the surface. So the thin localized nature of the uranium ore deposit means that all the material that reaches the surface from the mine must be sorted for grade. In the sorting plant, material from the mine passes over a light source on a translucent belt and is viewed from above by a solid snake camera, followed by a gamma ray spectrometer. Information on the size of each fragment and its gamma ray emission are combined in a computer which controls an air blast. This causes fragments to fall either onto the ore conveyor or to the waste pile. The cutoff grade can be adjusted by reprogramming the computer. The average grade is 0.44%, and from the 70,000 tons of ore mined each year, some 250 tons of uranium are produced. Reserves of this kind in deep veins are dwindling. New reserves of high-grade ore are needed and among the newest types of deposit to be investigated are different kinds of hydrothermal vein, an example of which lies in the remote region of northern Saskatchewan in Canada at Key Lake. The Key Lake mine is vast by open pit mining standards. It covers a total area of some 10 square kilometers. At the moment, the machinery behind me is clearing away a very thick succession of overburden. In places, it's 100 meters thick. It's made 
top of a loosely consolidated sand of glacial origin that is laid down on top of the Precambrian basement. The Precambrian basement here is overlain by the so-called Athabasca group. The Athabasca group is some 1,350 million years old. Here's a piece of the Athabasca sandstone. As you can see, it's a hard gray rock, which doesn't look particularly uriniferous to me. But below this sandstone lie the basement gneisses, the gneisses that are 1,850 million years old, carrying these rich vein deposits of uranium and nickel. But you see, everything's covered over so well by the sandstone and by this till. How then does the geologist find these rich uranium deposits? He can do this by either geophysical means or by geological means. The geological means are quite simple. All that's needed is a scintillometer. Geologists walk through the bush with the instrument and try to locate radioactive anomalies. But where do these come from? They come from small pebbles and boulders that have been scoured out of the basement and brought up into the glacial deposits. Let's have a look what we can find in this little succession here. At the moment, I'm not getting much of a count. But let's see what we can find in this outcrop. Ah, we're getting more counts now. Counts are rising. And what have we got here? Here, buried in the till, we have a black pebble of rich uranium nickel ore. It carries something like 50% uranium and 25% nickel. It comes from below us in the Precambrian basement, from these veins that have formed the basis for this vast mine. Airborne radiometric anomalies associated with boulders and cobbles of pitch blend were found within tills at Zimmer Lake, some 10 kilometers to the southwest of the present ore deposit. This discovery led ultimately to the discovery of the Key Lake deposit. First of all, the geologist traced the boulders to the point where the Athabasca sandstones unconformably overlie the Precambrian basement gneisses. The apparent source area was then subjected to intensive electromagnetic surveys. During this phase, it was realized that the conducting anomalies were in fact due to graphite-rich gneisses within the basement. These graphite gneisses were the localization of faults, for they formed weak horizons along which slippage could take place. The next stage in the operation then was to drill these conducting anomalies. This is the core storage area at Key Lake, and stored here are some 260 kilometers of core which were drilled during the exploration program. In front of me are some core boxes containing typical rock types from the Key Lake area. In this box here, we have the typical Athabasca sandstones and quartz pebble conglomerates. Moving across the box to this side, below the unconformity are these typical red granitic gneisses. These are rather unusual in that they contain some 50 parts per million of uranium. And between here, we have, in this box, the black graphitic materials, which were the cause of the geophysical anomalies, which led to the discovery of these rich uranium deposits. And in this box here, the rather colorful uranium and nickel ores. You notice that some of this material is green in color. This is the nickel that's weathering out. And the black material over there is the rich uranium, which runs up to 50% uranium oxide. Let's just take the scintillometer and run it across these boxes from above the unconformity, through the graphite gneisses, into the rich uranium nickel ores. After analyzing and interpreting all of this core, detailed sections were constructed to plan the mining operation. 
It's quite clear that the uranium nickel ore bodies lie in faults at and below the unconformity between the Athabasca group above and the older Precambrian metamorphic rocks below. During several repetitive phases of hydrothermal activity, uranium and nickel were sweated out of the Precambrian metamorphic rocks. The unconformity probably was the site of an abrupt change in physico-chemical environment. So as the mineralized fluids rose up through the faults, uranium oxides and nickel arsenides were precipitated at this level. Deposits here at Key Lake carry some 80,000 metric tons of recoverable uranium. When production finally starts, they'll be producing 6 million kilograms of uranium oxide per year, making this then one of the world's top three uranium producers. It could indeed supply 12% of the world's present uranium demand for two decades. Little wonder then that the operators have been willing to spend some $500 million just exploring and preparing for ultimate production. Within the first few years they will have paid off all of their debts and will become one of the world's most profitable mining ventures. Before production from the open pit mine can commence, they have had to lower the water table below the planned mining depth by draining local lakes. Once this was achieved, the thick sand overburden had to be removed and disposed of in an environmentally acceptable manner. see at Key Lake what we have is really just a special type of vein deposit. What happens when such a deposit is opened up to weathering? The answer has to be twofold. What happens today is vastly different from what happened in early Precambrian times. During early Precambrian times the atmosphere was reducing and uraninite could be weathered out of the rocks and transported and deposited in placers. That's what we've got in the Bitwatersrand in South Africa today. But today the atmosphere is oxidizing and the uranium is normally weathered out as the U6 plus state transported in rivers, maybe down to the sea, and will not be redeposited unless it encounters reducing conditions of the right EH and pH to transform that U6 plus into U4 plus. When this happens, the U4 plus is deposited in sands or in clays, and we have the famous sandstone hosted uranium deposits. And that's just what's happened here. I'm in the King Solomon mine in western Colorado. This mine is working uranium in sandstones of Upper Jurassic age, about 160 million years old. What's happened is that uranium has been leached by groundwaters to form a classic series of C-shaped roll fronts, rather like this. Oxidizing groundwaters then migrated through the sandstone in this direction, deposited massive uraninite or pitch blend at the redox boundary around here. Now as to the source of this uranium, well it was either present originally as the sandstone was laid down as detrital uranium minerals, or perhaps uranium has been introduced to the sandstone subsequently uh, by groundwaters. Later, groundwaters will migrate through sandstones and an earlier roll front may become oxidized, leaving some uranium in the form of spectacular orange and yellow oxidized ores. Close inspection of the sandstone shows that it contains fossilized plant fragments that have escaped destruction. And this is evidence of anaerobic reducing conditions. Now locally, the presence of organic matter like this has acted as reducing agents in order for uranium to be precipitated. And that's just what's happened up here. These spots contain black nuclei rich in uranium and white sandstone margins bleached by radiation.
Well, uh, another critical factor was the presence of these grey-green fine-grained mudstones which occur above and below the major sandstone unit. Now, their role was critical in two ways, in terms of inhibiting the oxidation of the sandstone. Firstly, they contain abundant, finely dispersed organic matter, and secondly, they're impermeable, and that means that the water was constrained to flow only through the sandstone, leaving mineralization such as this. And there's other evidence of the uh, conditions of formation of these deposits elsewhere in the mine. Well, what kind of environment was responsible for producing these mixed sands and clays rich in organic matter? Well, this large trough-like bedding feature is consistent with deposition in a river channel. And there's other evidence for this kind of environment in the mine. Well, here's a highly erosive contact where the sands are cutting down into the muds. Now, to produce such a contact, we need a high energy system, and again, a fluviatile regime is thought to have been responsible. And once that was established, it was soon realized that the slack water on the outside of river bends was a good place for organic matter and uranium to accumulate. Now, the geologists can, here can recognize the presence of such bends in advance of mining. Test holes are drilled into promising strata and are logged with a gamma probe. The mining system needs to be flexible to take account of the very rapid change in trend of the ore bodies. And here, room and pillar methods are used. About 80,000 tonnes of ore a year are produced at King Solomon, about the same tonnage but at a lower grade than from the Schwarzwalder vein. The simpler geology results in a less energy and manpower intensive mining system, which helps to make this lower grade deposit economic. This entire region of southwest Colorado is honeycombed with over a thousand old uranium mines. Few are still in production and most of their output is transported to a nearby mill, a man-made concentrating device where the ore is chemically processed into yellow cake. And that brings us full circle. The reason why we've examined the geology and occurrence of uranium ore deposits in such detail is to illustrate the sources of raw material that are available for the nuclear power industry. The rapid increase in the demand for uranium during the 1970s was based on the fact that hydrocarbon energy resources were thought to be rapidly dwindling. In the event, the uranium industry overreacted, and a rapid increase in the price of uranium was followed by a slump as the demand of the nuclear power industry turned out to be less than expected. Consequently, many small mines with lower grades of ore were forced to close, and it may be some time before the industry recovers. But of course, there's plenty of good uranium ore in the ground, if and when required by the nuclear power industry. relatively large crustal volume as fluids are drawn down towards the heat source. It's reprecipitated in concentrated form in the zone of cooling and upwelling. Fault zones are prone to this kind of mineralization, giving rise to vein type ore bodies. Fault zones beneath unconformities with overlying impermeable sediments are particularly ideal. Most minerals are found first in vein type deposits and most of the richest uranium ores occur in veins, often at depth. I'm 200 meters below the surface in the Schwarzwalder uranium mine near Denver in Colorado. And the rocks around here are all like this. It's a dark gray, fine-grained Precambrian mica schist. Now the schists are cut by a complex series of mineralized veins. Here's one example. 
Uranium deposits that are clearly associated with igneous activity are called primary. When a uraniferous granite or even a primary ore deposit is eroded, the sedimentary rocks forming in an adjacent depositional basin may contain secondary uranium ore bodies. Primary uraninite grains are broken down to produce soluble uranium-6 plus ions by oxidizing groundwaters passing through the sediments derived from a uranium-rich granite. Soluble uranium is carried along until conditions become sufficiently reducing that black uranium minerals are re-precipitated. Another way in which ore deposits can form within uraniferous sediments is when during a later phase of subsidence, orogenic activity and igneous intrusion, hydrothermal fluid convection cells develop over the heat source. Like granite, for example, provide the link between average crust and an economic uranium deposit. Now this granite's in the Rocky Mountains of Colorado. And I'm going to use this gamma ray spectrometer to record the natural radiation that's coming out of the rock. At the moment it's reading background, but if I point it towards the outcrop, the numbers and the note that's produced by the buzzer correspond to the amount of uranium that's present. And that number represents about 50 parts per million of uranium in this granite. That's a considerable advance on average crust, which was four parts per million. Now, uraniferous granites, like this one, probably represent the culmination of several phases of uranium concentration in the crust by remelting processes. Let's take a closer look at the rock. The minerals that are present are grey, glassy quartz, pink felspar, and black. Natural hot springs are confined to areas where molten, or at least recently molten, rocks occur close to the Earth's surface. And after four and a half thousand million years, it's clear that the Earth's interior is still hot, and that's because energy is being continuously produced by radioactive decay of long-lived isotopes of uranium, thorium, and potassium. Now, in the case of uranium, we can utilize the energy much more efficiently and rapidly by inducing those atoms to undergo fission in a nuclear reactor. And that's a much more efficient process than harnessing the energy of hot springs, such as these in Colorado. But for the nuclear industry to function effectively, we need to understand how uranium is concentrated in the Earth's crust in order to choose the best places to mine. Some igneous rocks, like flakes of biotite mica. A magnified thin section shows tiny crystals of uranium-bearing minerals contained within grains of brown biotite mica. Well, there are several geological processes that can take the uranium that's present in a granite like this one and concentrate it and so produce an economic ore deposit. And in this program, we're going to visit three working uranium mines in different geological settings. But first, we'll consider those concentrating processes. Imagine a piece of folded, metamorphosed continental basement, which is intruded by uraniferous granite. Economic deposits may be found in the coarse-grained pegmatites resulting from late-stage fluids that concentrate uranium. They are also deposited in the stockwork of small veins which form in fissures produced when the granite was emplaced. 